this is going to end. It's not forever. So you've got to use this time now to get better. Your weather is the weather for the organization, right? So if you come in here with a realistic view and based on data and not an emotional view based on fear, uncertainty, and doubt, then your likelihood of keeping the team productive is going to grow. The second key piece, sharpening the saw. How do you use the people that you're going to keep to streamline and automate everything? And that leads you to the third, which is you've got to be able to see your gross profit percentage. You've got to be able to study your margins and what has caused profits in the past, because that's what's going to cause profits in the future. We stand today. The Business Method with a shadow. The Business Method. The Business Method Podcast. The Business Method Podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneur's systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and welcome to the Business Method Podcast, a podcast featuring successful entrepreneurs and high-profile people dissecting their business models. We dissect the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. On our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that have built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that produce over a million dollars in annual revenue and now we're interviewing 100 major influencers to get behind the minds and the science of using influence to grow business and influence income results economies and cultures there's a growing number of people building these caliber of businesses like this and we're going to figure out what it takes to make this happen now let's jump in today's show the business method Hello, podcasting peoples. Today we have a treat for you. Again, another amazing entrepreneur, this time an individual that has been through six recessions in his entrepreneurial career. Starting out as an entrepreneur in the early 80s, this gentleman, his name is Stephen King, not the writer, the entrepreneur. Stephen King has successfully navigated a few decades of entrepreneurship, getting to the point to where he was an executive for a company worth $4 billion and now serving as the president and CEO of Growth Force, one of the nation's largest cloud-based accounting services. So he talks about some of the key steps when navigating through a recession, through these challenging times, and also some of the major lessons that he learned as an entrepreneur going through six other recessions. Without further ado, let's hop into it with Stephen King. Entrepreneur systems, methods, tools, and tactics. Listeners, welcome to the Business Method Podcast. We're glad to have you back today. And today's guest is Stephen King. Not that Stephen King, but one just as good. He's an entrepreneur and he's done some fantastic things in his life. From bootstrapped tech founder to a billion dollar executive, he's regarded as one of the accounting industry's top thought leaders. He's currently serving as president and CEO of Growth Force, one of the nation's largest cloud-based accounting services. Stephen has worked with Fortune 100 companies, and he's been an executive at a $4 billion company and a fundraiser at a nonprofit. He's launched bootstrap startups and piloted an industry-leading tech company. And importantly for today's talk with what's going on in the world right now, especially for you entrepreneurs, Stephen has also successfully navigated through multiple recessions as an entrepreneur. So he's got plenty of good wisdom he can share with us. Stephen, welcome to the show. How are you, my friend? Great, Chris. Thanks for having me. Good. Did I get your intro right? Did I miss anything? Yeah. Yeah. It just means I'm old, I guess. Nah. That's, you know, <laughs> you know, some people say that, but it doesn't mean it means you're experienced and wise. Yeah. So. I feel young. That's all I care about, right? That's all that matters, right? That's all that matters. So. So welcome to the show, my friend. I'm glad you're here. And uh, I was excited to, when I heard about you wanting to come on the show, just because of the experience that you had, you know, there's, especially in the tech industry, I would say most people have not navigated through a recession before. Um, most people aren't, well, I wouldn't say most, but quite a few people, especially entrepreneurs um, and, and visionaries of the companies aren't great with numbers too. So that's a good combination when you get somebody that has navigated through uh, recessions, depressions, crises, and somebody that understands how the numbers work because I'm the more the visionary type and numbers like me doing taxes, it's, it's, it's a mess, right? That's not my, 
my forte. But right. um, I, I really do enjoy talking to you guys that are really good at both those things, you know. And um, I think uh, we'll learn on the podcast, you know, what's important right now for entrepreneurs going through these these the, the recession, the crises, and, and how they can focus on that. So welcome to the show. How are you? You good? I'm good. I'm really good. Healthy. It's all that matters. It's all that matters, right? Okay. So now I know you've done quite a bit in your career and can, I, I just want to give you the mic for a couple of minutes, Stephen, and let you uh, tell us briefly about how you became the entrepreneur that you are today. Well, in high school, my dad said you should become an accountant because everybody always needs an accountant. Mm -hmm. And I happen to be good at it. I took a class in high school and I found, oh, it's organized. I get the debits and the credits and everything balances. This fits my personality. And um, I, uh, I worked for a CPA firm in college. And in 1979, they put an Apple II PC on my desk and a computer junkie was born. Oh, wow. And I've spent my entire life since then using technology to make life see easier for small business. I, let, I went to Ernst & Young and spent seven years there, and I learned how to do it for really big businesses. Designed, I was a manager of accounting system design, and, and I found Gulf and & Western and MasterCard get all this technology that my small business clients in college needed. And so um, I um, fast forward to... Netscape 1.0 comes out and I had this vision for uh, a, an outsourced bookkeeping business. I tried actually doing it with my own CPA firm, but 9,600 board modems and dedicated phone lines, it just didn't work. And um, once the web became a wide area network, we were able to carve out a really nice business called Virtual Growth. And um, it was great. We got to 250 people in seven cities raised 43 million in VC funding from like Citibank and Bessemer Venture Partners and, and Sperity was a, 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 an investor. They're an outsourced HR company. And we ended up, uh, they gave us an opportunity to come to Texas and I moved from New York City to Texas to help combine human resources and, and accounting. And so I've been running Growth Force as a, as a standalone company since 2004. And um, it's, it's just been phenomenal to be able to help so many small businesses weather this storm. It's incredible. And, and so let's look back on your career. So you were, you were starting off in, when did you start your first business? Uh, my, well, I'm, um, first real business, adult business, yeah. um, was, um, a, a, I did bookkeeping and accounting at night. At, at Ernst & Young. Uh, Debbie does dusting. I had three guys living in an apartment above a Blimpies in Hoboken. We were slobs. I uh, hired Debbie does dusting to come clean our house and she never sent me an invoice. And after <laughs> like a month of getting our house clean for free, I called her up and says, hey, you, I, uh, I need my house cleaned and you need an accountant. I can tell because you haven't billed me. So let's <laughs> barter. And that, that was my first bookkeeping client. I did her oh, billing nice. at night. <laughs> How great. What, so, what year was that, Stephen? That was the early 80s, 81, 80, no, I graduated 82. So 83, 84, okay. 23 years old. And then my second business was a concert promotion in New York City in the village. Um, the business model with there was very different. We weren't trying to make money. We were just trying to meet girls. And so we, I created a psyched production to basically throw concerts in the city. And I ended up getting um, a a gig with Amnesty International as a volunteer. And then I became the CFO and director of development for seven years. So I, I ran wow. money for a $20 million nonprofit right after Bruce Springsteen and Peter Gabriel and Sting finished this worldwide tour. And Amnesty grew from 6 million to 18 million in a year and a half. Oh, wow. um, yeah, that was a God thing. I got a call at Ernst & Young saying, hey, this nonprofit needs, needs, um, an accounting system. Can you help them? Cause you're in the manager of accounting systems. And I'll, I have amnesty posters all over my office because I was a volunteer there for three years. So it was really fun to see the nonprofit side. Very different. It's harder to run a nonprofit than it is to run a for-profit. I've heard that. I've heard that before. Um, okay. So early eighties and how many crises, recessions, depressions have you been through during that time? This is our, this is my sixth recession. And wow. basically, you know, every seven years is when you're going to see a cycle, right? Seven to 10 years. And it's part of a healthy economy. 
this is not not COVID. This is this one is different. But you know, you're 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 gonna have a contraction, and that's the time to make the hard decisions. Get rid of the dead weight, make the you know, sales will cover a lot of ills, right? Yeah. And so yeah. and so when sales go down, that's when you have to kind of get work smarter and sharpen the saw. And so okay, so let's let's go through those. Um it's it's part of a healthy economy. We need contraction and expansion, like it's a necessity. How how are you able? Because a lot of people are challenged with this. Because it, you know, in the tech industry, especially, it is their first recession. Not even most businesses were probably around in the '08 recession. How do you right. how do you take the emotions out of that when things are straining? Because for you, you've seen seven, six or seven now, and and so for you, it's normal. For you, you know they're going to come around. For you, um, so so for those that are experiencing it for the first time, like wh- what are some suggestions you give them? So you really hit, Chris. You really hit on the right word, which is the emotions. Right? It's all about right now, not making decisions based on emotions. You know, to me, it starts with getting the right mindset as the leader. You know, your weather is the weather of the entire organization. And so, so, you know, your health is your wealth, my Irish grandmother always said. And so if you're not, you know, my, my cousin in Queens is a nurse in, in an ER in a hospital that, you know, she's like, if you're not strapped to a ventilator, count your blessings. And I think that's the right attitude to start dealing with reality. You have to find a way to be feeling of some kind of blessing and gratitude and you know, if possible, abundance, because then it'll flow. And you also have to not make decisions while in a heightened emotional state, you know, especially when you add the political side, it's hard to not to, to think. So for me, the most important thing is to understand what data you need to have to, to pull yourself out. And it starts, number one is cash flow. You've got you've to have your fingertips on the daily, weekly, monthly cash flows. And we've got a great cash flow template that for QuickBooks users, it automates the process of downloading the age receivable and the age payable to make it real easy to not have to enter in all those customers and vendor names and see out 13 weeks. We recommend you need 13 weeks because it's quarter by quarter. And the reality is that we're really not going to know what's going on with the economy and how bad our clients are going to have it and their ability to pay us until the PPP money runs out and we can tell whether or not opening back up and protests create another bad COVID wave. Right. So that 13 week period allows you to get in front of it far enough to make decisions now that will help you solve that. So that's the first big data point. And then the second is you've got to do scenario planning. We have no clue what's going to happen. So you can't do a budget. You can't yet even do a real forecast. I mean, it's June when we're recording this. So you're naturally looking at this is the time to start thinking about the second half of the year. What's July 1 and to December 31st going to look like, right? So we advise our clients now you need to do a revised forecast. In these COVID times, I think you've got to do a scenario plan first. And, and what that means is you've got to, you've got to understand your break-even. You've got, to un- you've got to understand how much do you need to either bring in in top-line revenue or make as a profit margin to cover your fixed costs. Right? Break-even is, is the most important number after cash flow. And it's your fixed cost divided by your profit margin. You know, if you got a $3 million in fixed costs and you got a 50% profit margin, you need $6 million in revenue. So those are the three drivers, fixed costs, profit margin, and top line revenue. And if you can, if you can see, if I lose 10% of my revenue, what does that mean to my, do I go into the, can I, can I stay in the black or am I dipping into reserves? And then once you know that, then you either can improve your profit margin and you do that by, you know, your profit margin is your revenue minus your 
cost of goods sold, right? The cost to deliver the work. You either can find time leakage, find some time that you were giving away when things were good, and your scope creep just allowed you to have clients get more than they were bargaining for, or increase your fees to cover the real costs. And that's tough to do right now. But so the default for most people is, you know, raising revenue is tough, increasing margins is tough, and you look at your fixed cost. And we suggest once you do your scenario planning, what if you lose 10%? What if you lose 20%? What if you lose 40% of your top line revenue? How much do you have to cut in fixed costs? Because that's the cost that doesn't generate any revenue. There's your overhead. And so the smart businesses right now are thinking, how can I cut overhead? You don't have offices. Can we, do we need offices? You know, because if you don't have offices, you don't have, not only do you have not have the office, you don't have the cleaning. You don't even have, you don't have the supplies that people use as much. You don't have security. You know, there's just so many costs that go with the premise. The other part is looking at all your discretionary costs. What's, what's optional? You know, we typically send seven people at a cost of $20,000 to the big Intuit QuickBooks conference. And we also do zero and NetSuite, but we put most of our energy into QuickBooks because it's got 88% market share. That's 20 grand. We're not going to spend this year. So you have to cut those fixed costs first to see if you can get back into the black. And then um, go to the above the line costs, which are the people that are your direct labor, that you're in, your money makers. And which are the ones that are the most profitable? So the, the, the third thing we suggest here is you've got to understand gross profit margin per client now more than ever. To me, gross profit percentage is the number one most important data point number on any financial statement of all reports. And, and it's the reason why Shark Tank, they ask you how much do you, what, what are you selling it for? And then how much does it cost to make fully landed? Because they're doing that math quickly in their head. We, we, we're selling it for 10, we can make it for, for six, I can make 40%. And by seeing that now, it allows you to be able to figure out if I'm, if, I, if I'm losing revenue, who are the clients that I really need to keep? And if I want to go get, if I need to go find more revenue, what are the clients that I really want? What do they look like? How do I get more like this and put all your energy into that? Does that help, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I know one thing that we were talking about earlier is is not discounting not not discounting services, and you yeah. see everybody doing that. And so when it comes to profit margin, keeping your profit margin, keeping the the, the oxygen and the, the cash flow coming in to the company, um, so many people are discounting. Some people are like going to freemium models. Um, you recommend not discounting services. Can you dive into your ideas behind that and why it's important? Sure. This is probably the biggest lesson of, of having been through a lot of recessions. Um, because, you know, right now you talk about emotions, right? This is where the emotions kick in. And the natural reaction to, is to say, okay, I got to get some business in the door. So what, what I see people doing all the time is saying, let me just um, do whatever it takes to keep my staff busy. And that's a grave mistake. And the reason is that you, um, the, the single biggest reason why I see people who have cash flow problems is because they're not pricing their jobs right to cover their overhead and to generate a profit. Their cash flow comes from the free from the profit. And if they're if they're discounting, all that discount comes out of the cash flow. It all comes out of the money that goes into the bank. And so and the lower your gross profit, the percent the gross profit percentage that you have, right? This is another reason why gross profit is the most important data point in a business. The lower the gross profit, the bigger the impact that you have on 
on, on your cash flow and your profits. And I have a, we have a great calculator that calculates the impact of discounts. We'll, we'll make sure we, sh we put it in the show notes. We'll give it to you for the show notes so we can give it away. If you have a $100,000 project and you give a 10% discount, you have to sell 50% more at that 10% discount to make the same cash. It's crazy. If you have a 50% discount and you give, sorry, a 50% gross profit and you give a 10% discount, you have to sell 25% more sales. You know, I, I, I'll try to give a simple example. $100,000 business with 50% margins makes $50,000. You give 10% off, you now have $40,000 of profit. 44%. In order to get back that extra 10 grand, you got to sell 25% more. You got to sell $22,000 more at 44% margin to make the same gross profit. And so, so the, the, the challenge is that you, you, a lot of people feel like I need the cash flow. I need to get the deposit check. Or I have people on, on, on pay salary that I want to keep busy. It, it, it may be a, 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 an emergency short-term uh, strategy that I'm not suggesting you never give a discount. What I'm suggesting is that you need to have the data. You need to do the math. And that's what the calculator is designed to do. You need to be able to know if we give a discount, here's how much profit margin I'm going to lose. And if you do enough of that, you're now going to have to dip into your reserves. There's a, there's a great way to help you understand that. You know, we, we work with, out, we do outsourced bookkeeping, accounting, and controller services, either on a project basis or monthly, for companies that use QuickBooks, Zero, and NetSuite. And what we find is that if um, you take service business is what we focus on. For a service business, if you take all your overhead, and your target profit that you want to make and divide it by the number of billable hours you have on your company, you won't give that 10% discount away anymore because you'll realize, all right, all I'm doing is covering my overhead. All that discount came out of my profits. And if you do that math, if you calculate that overhead per billable hour and net income per billable hour, you can actually see when you're making a pricing decision, if I give a 10% discount, okay, it leaves me this much in profits. Conversely, the nice part is if you can do the flip side, if you can find 10% additional billings, which you typically can find if you focus on time leakage, then you can take Fridays off. You can sell 20, 25% less and make the same profits. Yeah. Steven, out of all the downturns that you've been through, can you tell us about uh, one of the times that was the most challenging for you and what you guys did in the business to recover? Sure. Um, 08 was hard because we were, the, we, the economy was on a boom and we were rocking. So we were hiring like crazy. And so um, we, had, we had some, all of a sudden we had some excess capacity. And so it's hard to let people go, especially after you've invested in training them. And so what we did was you know, we're, we, it takes me six months before a new person at Growth Force really gets to full speed, especially an accounting manager, because we're about management accounting. So it's not your traditional CPA firm. It's, you know, we do all that, but now it's about understanding what drives profits. What are the decisions that you're trying to make to increase profits? And then what, what reports should you have with the drivers on that? So what we did was, and I'm, I was reminded of this, this past, this, this, this upcoming recession as we were, we, we sharpened the saw. So I took those people, I said, okay, I, gotta, I, I, I have to figure out which of my people are the most profitable, which are the people that are the most valuable, and how do I make sure I don't lose them? And so what we did was we, we, we focused on studying the, the profitability of each team and each client and then each industry. We actually took it as far as going to see which marketing campaign so we could just start to study, okay, what has worked for us in the past? And then we documented, I had all the available staff. We created an internal sharpening the saw project 
where we wanted to document everything we did from the beginning all the way to the end. And I was reminded of it this time because now we're, we're doing it again. We're doing the exact same thing. We're, we're, we're actually you know, busy because so many people need help through this, but we are sharpening the saw by documenting into a training manual all the value that we deliver. And it's forcing me, to, it forced me back then in 808 and now to take those people that I've invested in and get their input and involvement on how we add more value, on how we streamline the sales process and how we automate, automate, automate. And we just had a call yesterday, Friday, where the, the overall reaction was two months into this now, we are already, and we were talking about this earlier, we're, we're working so much more efficiently than we did coming into this. Because we had a cash flow forecast that let me see how long will my cash last. And we did scenario planning where we said, okay, what, what, how much can we afford to lose? And, and, and we made the cuts that we had to make in the overhead and we kept our money makers busy with product, with new product development, with process improvement, with training. We're now doing training of staff that we're replicating our knowledge. You know, we created some new things over the last couple of years, but only six or seven people out of 60 know it. So sharpening the saw, automating and training the people is really what I think if you, to the extent that you can keep those above the line people, that's what I've learned to do. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, what about any other, do you have any other major lessons or any of the other downturns that's, that came about? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the automation part is really interesting. Um, I got to be uh, an, uh, an Inc. 500 featured speaker for a couple of years. And when you, um, so I had to come up with some content that was unique. And so they, they'd invite me back more than once. So I, I, we did a study of the Fortune 1000 company's cash flow best practices. And the, the, some of the things that, we, that were in there were surprising. Um, number one was that most um, small businesses I know do billing monthly. Why? Because it's easier for the bookkeeper. It's a batch process and you get all the paper together and all the project managers. And, and the difference in your cash flow by switching to a real-time billing from a monthly building is staggering. I mean, it completely changes everything. You'll, you'll, we, we found as if you can bill as soon as you finish a milestone or as, as soon as you finish the project and not wait till the end of the month, you, uh, and, then you, and then you automate the process, and I'll explain that in a second, you can get paid before you have to pay payroll. And that's the secret, especially in a service business where payroll is 70 plus percent of your costs, fully loaded labor costs are 70 to 80% when you add in benefits. And so by, by straight changing the, the timing and the, pro, the billing process, so we talked about automation. What I learned in Ernst & Young was the simple act of just going through and reviewing each step of the billing process and how many handoffs do, do you have? How many, um, uh, what's the process that your customers want to receive the supporting documentation? Um, what's the, build your billing process based on how it makes it easier for your client to pay you. The Inc. 500 study said the best run companies use their collection, they, they, their first phone call to a customer is not 30 days after the bill is passed due. It's before you start doing any work. When you get the contract signed. You have your bookkeeper or accountant. We do this for a client called Chief Outsiders. They're an outsourced CMO across the country. And we call and say, hi, I'm Kyle the, from the accounting department at Growth Force. We're the outsourced accounting department for Chief Outsiders. And uh, in, in the proposal, it says, you know, onboarding with Chief Outsiders. First step, call from Growth Force. And what we do is we go in and say, welcome to the Chief Outsiders family. Here, here's the contract. I just want to review the terms your bill is due on the 15th. And then we ask these series of questions. This is all from the study. Um, how do you pay bills? Who has to approve this bill before it gets paid? What supporting documentation do you need to have attached so that it can get approved quickly? What format would you like that to be in? Is it okay to send you a PDF or do we need to send you originals? And 
what you find is that by, by um, showing the client you're serious about getting paid, you're, you get to the top of the, of the pile. Um, the other big best practice right now is you got to make sure that your terms and conditions have who's going to pay the attorney fees if you uh, have to go to court because every recession that spikes up. You should add late fees is what we've done over the years is to, you know, not so that you can earn an extra 18% interest. And that's what we recommend, one and a half percent per month, but that you get your bill to the top of the pile because a good controller is going to pay the credit card with the 19% interest rate first, and then they're going to use the, pay the 18% interest rate and work their way down so that they don't run up any interest charges because that will kill your cash flow. And so putting all those terms in your, in your terms and condition now is a really good thing to do. And, and one of the big lessons of, of past recessions, I also, if you're not getting a big deposit up front, like 50% or more, you need to run a credit check because you're giving somebody a loan. And if somebody was bad at paying bills before COVID-19, they're going to be really worse now. So the big secret, I guess, Chris, the big lesson here from past recessions is don't let your clients' cash flow problems become your cash flow problems. <laughs> it's a great lesson, right? So I know we were discussing this before the show. How do, you, how do you predict which clients are going to make it through the recession, which clients are going to not... Um, you know, I've seen, I've worked with actually quite a few people that, you know, they, they, they have a good solid client base and boom, 40, 50, 60% are just knocked out almost instantly, you know? Yeah. And so that's really, really difficult. And then they've got to go out and then hustle and try to get some more clients on. Of course, you know, they're, they're working to reduce ex expenses, but sometimes there's just not enough to cover everything. Right. And so, uh, what would you recommend for predicting which clients are going to make it through the recession and how to manage that? So what we, what we've been doing is with clients is helping them go through a, you know, a one, two, three process, you know, one, we're good. All right. These are our number one clients. We're going to give them, we're going to love on them and we're going to count on them to stay with us for us to stay in business. The number, the threes are they're gone. Okay. So they're, they're in an industry that's hurting. They're in a part of the country that's, you know, really shut down. And number two is somewhere in between. Um, you know, there's no real easy way to do it. I mean, we, we get to see the balance sheets for every of our clients. So we know how much cash everybody has because we tell, we tell the business owners what, what's going on in their numbers. But the, for, you know, we do a lot of marketing agencies right now. And, you know, the, the conversation is very much around, you know, the industry and geography. And, you know, if you're in the airline industry or in the entertainment industry, then it's, you know, it's obvious. I just believe right now the big thing, and this is another big lesson over the years, is you want to over communicate. You want to be transparent with both your customers and your vendors and your banks. This is not a function of whether or not you have a good business model or you're a good business leader. There is nothing to be ashamed of. This is just normal process taken to 10x because of a, of a disease. and you know, we were, by, by, by picking up the phone and calling every client and asking them just what's reality. You know, we'll, we, 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 what we've been telling clients, we called every single client multiple times. Obviously, we're doing it anyway. But, you know, what, what, what we found right now is that you, if you do what's in the best interest of the, your clients, we're, we're not losing clients. They're on hold because we're advising them they just got to cut their costs. Or we're, or we're lowering fees as needed. So I think, you know, everything's negotiable. And then once you've got that, then you put it into your scenario planners. You know, that, budget, that break even template that I mentioned, it helps you calculate if you lose 10, if you lose 20, what you got to do. That, that one, two, three method will help you figure out, is it 10 or is it 50? And you mentioned over communicating, Stephen, like, um, what does that look like? Well, so we're uh, we're using now video right so everything's uh video messaging you know to the company to clients um but then one to one zoom calls this is one of the big benefits for us you know we're out of a service center in kingwood texas all right a livable forest northeast houston and we're we've been using zoom for years right where we were we were zooming before it was cool 
but our clients weren't. They didn't want to get on Zoom. You know, our manager, accounting manager was like, yeah, they don't want to. Um, now it's, it's looking somebody in the eye and seeing their furrowed brow and understanding what they're feeling and, you know, are, are, they, are they worried and can you help them and, and walk through that honest con conversation. Um, so that to me is what is the best communication right now. I, I, you know, I, it, it's hard to do 10 Zooms in a, in a day, but it, it, to me, it's just changed everything. So, um, and then, you know, pick it up the, as you're pivoting, right? We're seeing a lot of clients. We have some experiential marketing agencies, you know, that are, that are struggling, you know, especially in New York. And so they're, we're all pivoting. What can you do? You know, I talked to one in Atlanta uh, that was, you know, since they were used to creating supplies for all these events, now they're going to the healthcare industry to, you know, create branded supplies that you can give out as packages to business owners. Whatever, the, you know, now's communicating with your, your clients about how you can help them. So um, I don't know how else to answer that question except what we've been doing. Um, so we were addressing also, and I think you, you touched on these, the three choices that, that, hey, and I want to revisit this, Stephen, the three choices that entrepreneurs have, they want to make it through a moment, moment uh, an unprecedented moment of American history. And um, the economy is literally, I mean, like riots right now, COVID's been present for three months now, um, and it's pretty chaotic. So, so let's revisit those three choices really quick. Sure. So the first is the mindset, understanding the, you know, that the, this is going to end. It's not forever. So you've got to use this time now to get better. And the, uh, your, your weather is the weather for the organization, right? So if you come in here with a realistic view and based on data and not an emotional view based on fear, uncertainty, and doubt, then your likelihood of keeping the team productive is going to grow. Um, the second, and, and so that, that and as part of that getting the right mindset, it's really understanding what data do you want to have at your fingertips? You know, what's your cash flow is the first piece of, of data. And the um, cash flow is the most important to have. Um, and then the, the second piece of data is your scenario planning. You know, if you have, what's the best case, what's the mid case and the worst case. And after you've got that data, then it's a matter of sharpening the saw. So that's the second key piece. How do you streamline, you, you use the people that you're going to keep to streamline and automate everything. I start with cash flow. I would start with, you know, uh, bill payment, for example. If you're writing checks, you can save 87% of the cost of the bookkeeping to, for bill payment by turning on bill.com on your phone. And, and it's, you know, there's a, I was on the AICPA executive roundtable and a group of technology, accounting technology geeks. And the predictions were that the entire bookkeeping and accounting clerk function will be automated by 2023. Recently, I just read that that is completely accelerated right now because of sharpening the saw. All these people who are sitting, okay, we're not, we're not going to fire our, our money makers that are well-trained, that have been with me for a long time. So now let's put them to productive work to make the company better. And one of the, one of the stories we just had come in was somebody had to let their controller go because they couldn't afford $125,000 controller anymore. It's overhead. So overhead's what you cut first. And he, but that person was paying the bills and, you know, preparing the checks and, what we were able to do is by implementing bill.com, teach the CEO's admin, executive assistant, how to pay the bills and how to code them. So by automating it, the cost of their bill payment is going to drop from, we figure about $12.35 to pay a bill. Wall Street Journal says it costs $20 for each average business owner to pay his bills, down to $1.50. And you reduce the risk of fraud. That's another big thing right now. Fraud's a whole other topic. Desperate times create desperate measures. And I was the, that was my specialty at Ernst & Young was internal controls. You've got to make sure that you are, you, you are separating certain duties. Don't let the person who's writing the checks reconcile the bank account. 
We just found this just now where a bookkeeper for one of our clients was paying, was, was trying to pay an AT&T bill. In addition to the company bill, she tried to pass her own AT&T bill. Because we have bill.com, we could see the scanned image and we asked the owner, do you have another account? It's like, no, why? There's, she submitted a $685 phone bill. We found out later that it was because her kids were home streaming Tiger Kings on their iPads. Oh, wow. <laughs> she didn't have an unlimited data plan. And so because the kids suddenly had unfettered, they didn't have school, so they had unfettered, they were allowed to watch endlessly. And that's going to happen. You know, when you, when you look for fraud, you're looking for changes in behavior. You're looking for people who have changes in their financial situation. There's a lot of people who lost their job, right? 20, 30 million. So you've got to separate the duties. You've got to implement, uh, the, the, and the technology allows that. Um, the, so that's, that's the second big thing, right, is, is streamlining and processing, streamlining everything. How many steps does it take you to get a proposal out the door? How long does it take you to, to do pricing? How do you do pricing? What's the data you're looking at? And that leads you to the third, which is you've got to be able to see your gross profit percentage. You've got to be able to study your margins and what has caused profits in the past, because that's what's going to cause profits in the future. If you know, if you can see, and QuickBooks does this automatically um, if you have Intuit Payroll. If you don't, you can use Insperity Payroll um, for QuickBooks Desktop and QuickBooks Online. And what it does is it, it, both of those companies have activity-based costing. That's the secret sauce, right? With the Fortune 1000 companies, used to be the only companies that could get this. Now it's available to every small business that uses QuickBooks. And what it does is it takes your labor costs out of the payroll, divides it by, and it allows you to allocate your labor costs above the line and below the line. And if you don't have timesheets, you can allocate that at the company level and in each department. And that's valuable because now you can see the profitability of each profit center. You can break that down into teams. You can see the profitability of the teams within each profit center. If you have timesheets, it's really magical. Because then what it does is it takes the, the labor costs fully loaded, right? You're, you're with Insperity, it's got your salary and your taxes and your benefits and your 401k and you're recruiting the whole package divided by the number of hours that you work and it comes up with a lo fully loaded labor cost per hour paid. And then it posts back inside QuickBooks those labor costs based on how they filled out the timesheet. So how much did it cost on customer A, job two, providing service Z? I can now see profitability by customer, by job, profitability by service or product or department. And once you've got that, once you understand the unit economics, the smallest piece of economics is your customer or your job, then you can go into the accounting system and you can start attaching information to the customer based on the decisions you're trying to make. So right now we've got clients who are trying to decide, you know, all right, should I, should I renew this sponsorship in a trade show. I got a client who, who said, you know, I got a six figure bill for this trade show. And in January, he said this, and, and we're a partnership for tax purposes. So we distributed all our cash to all the partners. So I don't have six figures sitting in the bank. So I thought I'm gonna pass on this sponsorship. But can you tell me how much revenue we got from this sponsorship? And we said, yes, but you're asking the wrong question. You need to know how much profit did you get. It's not about how much you bring in. It's about how much you keep. And that sponsorship was four times better than your next biggest sponsorship. He's like, oh, my God, I almost didn't do that. So, so this is the time to get gross profit percentage because then you can make data-driven decisions, data-driven decisions about everything that causes profits. What industry is the most profitable? What sales reps generate the most profits? Like we talked about before, the impact of discounts is staggering. More, that'll do more to destroy a business than anything else. And so you can see which sales reps are selling you as a commodity and which sales reps really understand the value and can get an extra 5% premium. And then study that sales rep. Take this time when sales reps are not doing anything and say, okay, what's your talk tracks? 
What's your hooks? What's your value proposition? Train these guys. And then, you know, sharpen the saw in sales. You want to do this across the whole organization. What I suggest here, this is a really important time to do a budget or a forecast. I should say, not a budget. Budget starts in January and never changes. But every quarter you revise a forecast. It's hard to do a forecast right now because you don't really know. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're taking our mid case is our forecast. We did a best case, a mid case, and a work case. And we're saying, okay, what if we lose X percent? And, and our, we cut our fixed cost by Y percent. The reason why this is so powerful is, number one, it turns your basic income statement into an actionable financial statement, meaning if you just get an income statement and you're not looking at budget versus actual, you're missing half the story. You're missing what you hoped would happen. And you're, you know, the most important decision you're going to make as an owner is where do you spend your time? And so if you are a tech company going through your first recession right now, right, you've got to be able to figure out, all right, where, where do I have problems? And, um, being able to have budget versus actual allows you to focus and pinpoint where the biggest problems are. And without that budget, the actual results are almost meaningless because it really depends on what you expected and hoped would happen. The other reason why a budget is so important, you know, we are big proponents. I, I, I can't emphasize this enough. You know, this is my, my, my fourth real startup. And the difference between Growth Force and all the prior three ones, including virtual growth, was I now have learned the impact, the impact of a human capital strategy and a financial management strategy together. By doing a budget and cascading that budget down to the department and, the, and that department goals down to the individual, Harvard made a landmark case study where they said the simple act of writing down goals will increase your likelihood of success by 82%. It's like, wow. That's crazy. I got to read that. It was a really boring report. <laughs> I could imagine. <laughs> but, but what I learned out of it was, you know, you would expect certain things. You're going to get more alignment. You're going to get people rowing in the same direction because everybody understands what the goals are. The simple act of writing down goals increases your likelihood of success by 82%. And what I didn't expect, though, was that if you – if you, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs kicks in. We have a need to belong to something bigger than ourselves, right? It's, it's right above safety and safety's right above survival. So this is a basic need. I'm a Mets fan for God knows what reason, but you know what? I need to belong to my New York City sports. And what happens is when you, when each person knows the role that they fit into the overall success of their department, and they understand the role of their department in the overall success of the, of the company, they're not going to let the team down. They're going to give you discretionary effort. They're going to start acting like an owner because they own the outcome. And this is where the human capital and the financial management comes together. If you recognize and reward the people who contribute the most to profits, they'll start acting like an owner. And so, so I suggest right now you bring your management team together, you walk through the scenario planning tool, and then we've got a blog where we've identified the five top budget tools uh, from, a, from a company called Fendera. They are, they're a cash flow tool, and they, they did the best blog I've seen. It identifies the five best cash management tools, and you pick the one that works for your business if you don't have one. But if you do, well, either way, now's the time to update it right? July is the half year mark and get your managers owning the outcome, getting them to say, okay, what do you think we should be doing on each aspect of the business? And, and, you know, we're actually finding people, controllers who are doing this coming in and saying, I think what you need to do is let me go <laughs> because oh, wow. you, you don't need us right now. Yeah. That story that I just mentioned where we use bill.com to teach, to do the bill payment, the controllers told the owner, you, got, you, I, you can't afford me right now. We've lost 45%. So, yeah, it's tough. This is tough times. But I think by, making, by having a budget, by getting your management team together and focusing on sharpening the saw, doing the things that you always wanted to do but didn't have the time, that's what you use the recession for.
It's great points, Stephen. Excellent points. I think that's a, a good place to wrap up as well. Um, do you have any final tips before we close off the podcast? No, I think, you know, this is a good time to look at outsourcing and anything below the line in particular. Sales, you can outsource marketing, IT, HR, um, accounting, because what that does is it changes a fixed cost into a variable cost. And as your business is going to go down, you got to get your as minimize your fixed costs. You know, we talked about rent. I think the the you know the extent that you your business model. The, what I've been seeing is the companies that really leverage outsourcing as a strategic advantage do really well right now, because you know we're going to people right now and saying, hey, we can cut your fee by 30, 40 percent. And we're, we're telling them we're going to cut their fee because they don't have the volume of transactions. They, they're neat. Let's get down to bare minimum. And then in six months, you know, hopefully we'll come back. You can't do that to a full-time employee unless you give them different job responsibilities. That's it. Makes sense. Steven, uh, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. We really appreciate it. It's always good to hear from an experienced entrepreneur that has been through this before. And if the listeners want to reach out and learn more about what you have going on, where's the best place they can do that at? Growthforce.com, G-R-O-W-T-H, force.com is our website. We've got a resource tab that we share all these tools um, that I mentioned, the cash flow forecast, the break-even analysis. We've got some key KPI tools on there. And I've got a podcast, Put Your Numbers to Work, where I talk to people who are really good at using those tools. So I'm also on... Uh, LinkedIn, it's Stephen King with a PH, Stephen King CPA. And uh, Twitter is S King G Force. And you can email me at Stephen, S T E P H E N, at growthforce.com. Perfect. Again, Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Chris. Nice to be with you. And listeners, we're going to wrap up there. Thank you guys for tuning in once again. And we'll see you on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Hey listeners, thanks for joining us once again. We wanted to remind you about our high performance productivity coaching and our five, six, seven, and eight figure private masterminds. These are all designed for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs to help you scale rapidly and grow. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com. That's thebusinessmethod.com. And we'll see you all on the next episode.